Cool. Okay, great. I'm, I'm recording. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So where shall we where shall we begin? I mean, the, the main thing that I that I want to do here is uh, is just provide uh, some context and talk about um, uh, the high level requirements um, for this kind of work as they as they exist in my head. Uh, and you know, I think I'm to to a significant degree sort of speaking on behalf of uh, Manfred and, and and other people that are that are involved, but. Um, yeah, so so we can get into that, but I, I don't know. What did you guys already talk about, or I, I don't want to uh, repeat anything. Uh, already... Nothing, nothing much. We mostly talked about health condition, but uh, <laughs> rather than that, <laughs> okay. which is, seems to be a recurrent theme in this in this team. But maybe maybe I can just really start with a really really quick uh, overview, or maybe a kind of an introduction on on how what, yeah, what be prompt awesome. me to to make this proposal. Yeah, if you want to do so, that, and, and if you if you want uh, Pedro to just to just go through a you know like a, a present just a design presentation just like you would in, in, in any other uh, you know gig basically that would be uh, excellent. Well, I don't have access to my computer right now, but the uh, presentation but, was very yeah. very concise, so I can but I can I can quickly go through. We could we could try to. Take my screen share. I'm not sure if the upload is working. Okay, can I can you... see it. I can see it quite well. Yeah. Okay. How, how about um, Rodrigo? Can you see the screen as well? One second. Yes. Sure. So maybe I can do a quick, a quick presentation. So just a action for myself about me um, so I've been I've been working and based out of New York for about uh, I've worked in maybe two different studios I'm, I'm now working on a study very much focused on kind of visual design and very maybe commercial driven and also very focused on fashion and um, kind of the um, retail industry. And I've also been kind of involved with Bitcoin, mostly out of a kind of a ideological motivation since, I guess, I don't know, 2011. Even though I, I've, I've started bu buying early uh, through Coinbase and Mt. Gox, I've lost a lot of stuff on the way. Mm. But... Um, what prompted me mostly throughout the last couple of months was finding all these um, barriers to entry on the on the standard ex exchanges and getting really frustrated with a lot of people with the price going up. I had a lot, a lot of people uh, reach out to me and asking me of ways to getting in and uh, all sorts of questions. And I felt a, a big, big frustration from their end on how to quickly uh, acquire some bitcoins for fi uh, for fiat, and I noticed that um, a lot of the big frustration, big of the reason, the main reason for this frustration was because of the the big promise that was made uh, from all the, the big bitcoin enthusiasts that everything was so seamless and everything was so convenient, and actually they were finding the 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 beginning of the process to be actually quite quite uh, hard and also all these exchanges closing down and all the the regulation in different countries making everything so complicated and then at some point maybe actually a couple of months ago I came across one of the one of the Andreas Antonopoulos videos he mentioned BISC and at the po at the time I kind of re disregarded it but then I it came back again, mostly when when I got the, the text forms from Coinbase and I thought, man, how do they know all this crap and why should I allow them to know all of this? And all their estimations were wrong because every time I moved Bitcoin from in there or out there, they considered they that a text. Of, sale, right? Yeah, I was really scared when I found, found that I was like a, a lot more, I, I, I supposedly owed a lot more taxes than I uh, thought because I actually didn't sell that much. Every All my Bitcoin transactions are either between my wallets or when I go to places here in New York and try to spend Bitcoins for like $6 kava drinks or something or like a $100 dinner 
it's not like I'm selling big amounts. So and then I thought, okay, how can I how can I make this more private and how can I make this just my own information? I tried using a bunch of ATMs here, but they still ask you for a phone number, even though it's only for verification. It's still they still store your phone number. And then I finally decided, okay, I'm going to go back to that old video I saw about decentralized exchanges because at the time I also tried Ether Delta and it didn't seem like, okay, it's great to, to, to trade altcoins, but anything that's not a ERC20 token or anything that's like from dollar to, to cryptocurrency is pretty much impossible in a decentralized manner until I actually found... BISC and I tried it a couple of times through Venmo and then through Zella and I thought the experience was like, well, this is I can't believe nobody else is talking about this. Mm. Like, this is the easiest, most efficient, most private, most decentralized, peer-to-peer dollar-to-cryptocurrency transaction and it's amazing that nobody else, like, this should be up there on the like B tracks and Kraken in terms of news coverage, but somehow it, it's not. And also, I, I then started researching, and there's a lot of a lot of new exchanges that are trying to do the same thing, but only either to for token uh, transactions or in a centralized manner, like like websites, like local bitcoins. That I, I found a couple of other ones that I forget the name. And other ones that are just kind of on the white paper stage. And this is like a running prototype that's been running since, what, 2016? Yeah, we, we just had our, our two-year anniversary of our first mainnet trade on the, on the 20th. So it's two, two solid years in production. So yeah, it was really, I was really excited about the fact that the, there's a prototype. It's running. It's working. Obviously, like any piece of software, it has problems. Like, I don't know, I wouldn't expect anything to be perfect, but I also noticed I, I watched a, a lot of videos and a lot of interviews, especially with Manfred, and I realized, yeah, this, this guy, I think, really knows what he's talking about, and he seems like his vision really coincides with mine. And I thought, well, maybe some people, even though to me personally, when I landed on that website and the fact that the, the design was so bare bones, it actually made, it gave me a level of confidence that it was not okay, <laughs> this is not ne- another one of those fancy ICOs. And exactly. But at the same time, I, I, I would expect some people to land on the website and maybe feel a little, not threatened, but maybe a, feel a little bit of a lack of confidence. And I thought, well, Let's maybe just, uh, I, I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know Java. I, uh, my knowledge about Bitcoin development is extremely limited. So the only way I could contribute would be with design. So I thought, well, why not just participate like in this project by suggesting something? And then I did. And it actually, um, I don't know, I just sent something to, to Manfred on Slack he reacted positively. We then had a long conversation just about, I thought we were going to talk about the technicalities and uh, about everything. And we just ended up talking a bunch about the, the whole philosophy behind the whole project. Mm. And also and also just something that I don't understand why no, not a lot of people are talking about it. This is the whole DAO and the, the fact that we're just having this call right now. Like, I don't know, you guys don't know me, I don't know you. I, I, I feel like I know you guys already because I've seen so many of your videos. And that's kind of the, the interesting part of this openness about all these discussions and all these meetings. They seem very familiar because the, the structure is exactly like the meetings I have at work, but it's all out there in the open and it's like worldwide. You no, know, there's Europe, America, I don't know, there's probably people collaborating on GitHub from all over the world and it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, right on. Well, that's, um, that's all uh, yeah, music to my ears, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, maybe if, uh, I'll just make, just make one comment. I could comment, comment on a ton of stuff in there, but um, uh, before we like jump into, to, you know, kind of you presenting the design, um, you, you know, you mentioned like when you first landed on the, on the website, I'm going to try to share my video. Hopefully it doesn't kill kill the connection. Let's see. Can you guys see me okay? 
Uh, I can see you, yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, um, I just see the presentation. No. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe the phone interface doesn't doesn't do it so well. But um, whatever for for posterity, I'll record my my video if it doesn't if it doesn't make the, the audio choppy. So um, you know, you talked about landing on the website and having a you know pausing for a moment, right? But but in a way, like actually becoming more confident, um, ironically, right? And and I think it, this is this is a lot of hindsight talking uh, for me, but but as as the years have gone by, right? And now as that website, uh, you know, most definitely needs a refresh, right? Um, it, uh, to, to say the least. Uh, I've actually come to be quite happy uh, that, we, that we never did um, for exactly that reason uh, that, you know, you saw it and you're coming, you're already coming from a particular uh, ideological, you know, viewpoint and, and you're, you're, you know, compared to all the people in the world, you're for sure like, you know, uh, uh, have a lot of expertise in, in the nuances and idioms of this space. And it's actually a, a negative to have, you know, basically the standard ICO looking flashy website. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's actually become a, a strangely an asset for us, uh, is that it's basically a filtering mechanism. Yeah, I totally uh, agree. That, that's actually something I was... I don't know if it, maybe some, it was mentioned in one of your discussions, but I, I worry you, everybody, you guys keep talking about the lack of, uh, um, what's the word, um, chargebacks that have been happening. And mm. I, I, I guess that a lot of that is because of the, the, the very diligent way that you include payments, but I would suspect that it's also maybe because people that are participating in that market are maybe very drawn, very drawn to be honest, and there's not a lot of fraud trying to be committed. And I, I worry that at some point, if the network really grows, it's going to attract all kinds of people that are going to try to to really exponentially grow the the amount of fraud happening there. Yeah. So it, it, I think it was a really good. I think Manford mentioned yeah, sure. this. That's and that's and at, the, at this point, that's basically. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I think no. Oh, I was just oh, say, Man, Manford mentioned that. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. He, he mentioned that the it's good to allow the network to grow with honest uh, participants, and then exactly then invite the non the, the nefarious actors to kind of that's try right. to break it down, but it, let it be strong enough that it's like growing too fast is like maybe it will fall too fast. Yeah, that's, that's exactly my point. You might be making it even, even better than I am, which is that I think this filtering mechanism that we've had in place of basically being a team uh, of the opposite of uh, marketers, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, actually, I actually do have some marketing experience. Christoph does too, but we're fundamentally engineers, right? And, and you know, I'm, I'm fundamentally, if I'm doing any marketing, I'm fundamentally marketing to developers and to cypherpunks. Uh, basically, with with everything we do, from Twitter to you know uh, the videos that we put out to the podcasts that we put out, uh, so basically to attract the right base and to and to build that foundation of um, of, of both users and contributors that are deeply aligned with what we're up to. So we have lots and lots of um, uh, you know power and strength. We have like enough contributors showing up, thinking about and building this every day. The users that we have are, um, you know, they're basically the right kind of users to help us move through those stages that at this point looks kind of inevitable. We're going to move through, right? We've seen mm -hmm. big spikes on the network. That's probably going to continue to happen. Uh, and so I think it's actually, it's a good time to, to do the kind of work that you're, that you're proposing here. Uh, because we can't keep that around forever. We, the, the way that I think about our growth, right, is that, is that we've been, we've grown in essentially a totally organic way uh, for those two years. We've started to add some, some intentional fuel to the fire with these like growth calls that we, that maybe you've seen, yeah. these liquidity weeks that we've mm -hmm. been kind of spearheading and stuff like that. So we start to try to tweak the, the, the dials a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, uh, 
sorry, just a second. I just have to track back to my thoughts. That's probably the, <laughs> the drugs talking to. Um, uh, but, the, but the way I think about our growth essentially is, uh, is that we want to, yeah, just, just that, take it, take it step by step, right? right? And to, to introduce, um, you know, a new website refresh now and, and, and all that, basically I think it's good time. Um, yeah, sorry, I just have somebody calling me, but I'm gonna hang it up. Um, so yeah, I had another point in there, but I've actually lost it, so forgive me. Um, it, but uh, it, yeah, so so let's um, let's jump into it. If you want to go through the through the uh, design sure. review, Pedro. Yeah, I, I will start sharing again. Just a sec. Okay, I have to stop full screen. Um, second. So I can I can maybe just talk a little bit about the yeah. the whole the, the so the as I mentioned before the the main motivation for this was just to try to without like a complete overhaul and maybe to keep some familiarity with whatever was already defined. I don't I'm. I'm even hesitant to talk about this as a brand, but there's some, there's probably already some um, recognizable elements that people have uh, grown accustomed to, even though the um, the base is rather small in terms of, I think, of its potential. But I thought that maybe just introducing a little bit of a, like a best best or more common practices in terms of communicating uh, a brand in this space. I thought about this in this in this slide. We're just showing the um, the way the the logo can be kind of balanced in conjunction with the symbol. And even though I my my interpretation of this black hat, um, I thought it was interesting element to use in in the the BISC decentralized exchange because I feel like it's a a little bit of um, like a sneaky yet uh, friendly animal. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to keep that, but maybe use it more as a, as a mark as opposed to a whole figure and a whole illustration. And so I tried to, I started working on the, with the face and I tried to keep the, the whole uh, dynamic relationship between the background and the contour of the, of the, face of the the cat and keeping that ear as a kind of defining moment and then for the typeface i just thought that the, the typeface felt very um, uh, bare bones so i customized another typeface and removed some of the elements of the um, of the customized typeface to make it more round and more distinguishable and just a little bit more uh friendly looking also to to match the kind of roundness of the the symbol yeah, what I like a lot uh, compared to the old logo is that the old logo, logo and the logo type itself always felt a little bit disconnected. It, it takes a lot of space mm -hmm. and still doesn't feel connected. And we also saw uh, using the, the icon in different kind of platforms, maybe it's YouTube or Twitter or whatever, the cat uh, is always so super small that, um, that you, mm -hmm. you're not recognizing it a lot so so having it already in, in a in a way that it's really fits into this small sized icons also I think helps a lot yeah and yeah I, I like it personally but yeah of course that's probably just my personal taste <laughs> excuse me you dropped out uh, sorry did that last uh... it, it might be just my, my my personal taste but i like uh, oh, okay the, the revision of the logo and the logo type you did uh, better than how it was before. Yeah, and uh, just the, sorry, just to look back in, uh, to the to the conversation of the process and like uh, the centralized um, uh, decision making. I don't know. Maybe this is something that we can all. I can also work with uh, Diogo in kind of developing a way where these visual materials could be shared on GitHub and maybe the comments and the feedback could be also shared by everybody there so there can be a 
an open discussion on how to improve, change, or um, correct these more visual things. Any yeah. code pool, uh, it's, it's like it either works or it doesn't, but with a visual element like this, there's a lot more subjectivity to it. Yeah, I also think uh, you just... The audio it would just be interesting broke. to try to get it. Hmm? Sorry, the audio just broke, but uh, I got it. Yeah, um, there was also one thing that worked quite okay uh, in, in the past when, uh, of course, I just did minor changes, so I didn't do huge design changes, but we also tried to, to have all the communication uh, within uh, a GitHub issue and had the design iterations there and, and the discussion and... That worked quite okay. Yeah, the question is how, how we can do it so it's not very very slow in, in the in the process or um, makes yeah. it burdensome for for doing these these changes in a big style. I'm sure we can do it. I mean, um, with Slack, uh, GitHub Slack integration, I'm sure that it's possible. I heavily used github for a while so i'll only back and we learn a little bit of commands but it should be fine if it so works I, for code it probably works for for jpegs or for dfs yeah that's that's all no problem um uh, we can we can certainly set things up there i, I have <laughs> models in mind for how to do this I've, I've, I've done um so it's actually something that's that's um a strong part of my own um past right with previous companies always on open source for, for the last many years but that have helped coordinate a number of design refreshes for um for prominent open source projects uh that uh, that are uh, they've always been like deeply substantive like not just a design or a brand refresh you know reworking a logo or logo type uh you know reskinning the website and so on but also um you know uh complete overhauls of uh, approaches to documentation, right? Like the kind of complete package, how we address a user base uh, with, with these open source projects that I've worked on have been some of, some of my sort of proudest work actually. Um, and we're, we're always doing all of that in, in GitHub and Slack. So, so I, I have no concern uh, about the infrastructure for doing that. The question for me is, is more about, um, uh, infrastructure aside, like details of GitHub and Slack aside, is um, uh, ha actually how much feedback do we really want? Um, I think it's certainly a good idea to, to, to float what you've done and get some initial feedback. But in my experience with, with design matters, like you know, design by committee really doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, so, so this yeah. <laughs> actually isn't. This is this is an exception for me, right? This this is this is a situation where um, if somebody can come to the table with a strong design vision and and the ability to uh, to apply that vision in, in 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 lots of different contexts, and these are some of my questions for you, Pedro. Is um, is like um, just not knowing really anything about your background. Have you have you led these kinds of efforts before? I mean, your your work looks very polished, and like how you present it with PDFs and so on. So I so I imagine you have, but um, yeah, this is the the kind of the, this is the type of work. Now I'm I'm much much more focused on web design for the last year, but uh, mm -hmm. for the last I guess seven to eight years of my career, this is basically what I've been doing initially with much more much more related to cultural institutions and lately more related to uh, fashion and e-commerce brands mm -hmm. but basically yeah yeah so i'll just say a little bit more but on I, uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, on that front and, and christoph you know please please weigh in here too because this is the first time we've really done this this kind of work like hey let's you know let's do some design visual design thinking digital design kind of thinking stuff so for me the the ideal just perfect world way the magic wand would be somebody perhaps like yourself shows up they've got a very strong vision they have an ability to to, to execute that in the sense of not not implementing it actually sounds like you're in the middle of implementing it which is also great like you know on the website that's fantastic if you can do that but it's more about like being able to service you know uh 
applying or adapting that design vision in all the different contexts and channels that we have, right? So, so how does this manifest at, at the level of the, of the app, the splash screen, you know, every, every element of the app, fonts, you know, how did, not just the website, but we also have a new uh, documentation website that we just stood up the other day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there, there are, you know, interesting constraints there where it's, you know, it's not just carte blanche. You can't just sort of like say, well, this is how I think it should be but rather you sort of have to work with the existing constraints of our, of our documentation infrastructure, right? But whatever it is, right? You know, what should show up in the Twitter banner for the this network Twitter handle, like all of that stuff. The ideal for me is that there's, is that there's actually one very strong owner who has like extremely high EQ, you know, like emotional intelligence, right? Who can take all the feedback and just be like a stellar, you know, designer. Like to me, that's, that's the ideal designer is somebody who basically has it all worked out and then is open to feedback and can iterate and iterate and iterate, but, um, but, but they're not pulling any punches, right? They're like, Hey, you know, th this is actually what I think makes sense. I have a vision here. Right. And that we, that we yeah. approach that, that vision. We basically build the same vision, same mental model together over time, but, it, but it's really led by the, uh, by the designer. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, Totally open to, to being that person and uh, maybe working with somebody else that also comes into the fold, like maybe Diogo, just to think about other aspects or maybe just to, to work as a team to have kind of a, a working relationship where there's like a direct feedback and even with you guys. And to, to be honest, I, I suggest this very open process on GitHub, but I actually never did it. My, my previous projects have always been in a very closed environment where it's Everything is confidential. Uh, there's um, NDAs circulating all by everybody, and there's like there's our team, and then there's the client, and that's everything. That's we only user tested and address user feedback after maybe a year. So I understand yeah. that maybe asking inputs the input of a thousand different people with different backgrounds and different cultures might not be the right idea because they all might have different uh, tastes. So I do understand and I, I would probably defer to you if you have more experience in, the, in these uh, types of situations. Um, maybe you could recommend the best process. In terms of, in terms of being the person that owns this, this part, I'm totally open to that. My only problem is that I currently have a day job that yeah. uh, takes some time and I, I, because I feel very passionate about this, it, it doesn't really worry me getting home and working on this for another five hours because I don't even, I almost don't feel it, feel it as being work. It's just it's like it's either dead or watching a movie, but there, there is a little bit of a time constraint. Um, yeah, for oh, yeah. sure. I, the, the the kind of um, workflow that I've that I've had before. I, I don't mean GitHub infrastructure, but I just mean sort of uh, roles and responsibilities. Right? Is um, is it you know basically the design lead is is producing uh, comps, you know, uh, making making font decisions or you know putting them forward anyway, mm -hmm. right? But like basically producing comps, and then you know somebody else is 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 cutting them up and applying mm -hmm. them. And, 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 and things like that. Again, if it's if it's you that can do that, all the better. But but I think that if we take, you know, I've been so eager to like just kind of like tweet out to the world what you what you showed us in that PDF. I just wanted to have this call first uh, and sort of get aligned because I think I think when we put this out there and we say you know like hey this is sort of the the face of BISC to come, uh, I think we will have absolutely no problem finding some solid HTML5 people to to implement it. Right, I think, it's, I think it's pretty exciting stuff. So, so no worries about having you know enough kind of manpower. I think that's going to be fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Re regarding workload, I also think so. If if there are there's two parts in my my opinion regarding the client. So on the one hand side is it's a design change. So if we want to do a kind of a redesign of of, of the application as it is at the moment, or um, what kind of changes conceptual like or, or organizational like we want to do on the client as well. And if you come up with, let's say, um, kind of a, a couple of master screens and different layouts, 
and uh, we find a way how to share this uh, in a library kind of way that, that people just can pick, it, pick up all the elements that are provided and can provide suggestions for different kind of greens, uh, especially, for example, Diogo, you already talked with each other and mm -hmm. you can, can work easily as a team. Then I think that that could work. The question for me is, Chris, maybe you also want to weigh in, um, if how big of a design change you want to do, if you want to do kind of a complete overhaul design change of the client, finish, also finish the design work and then make a change or if you want to do kind of an iterative approach, of course, which is kind of complicated if you want to do a, a big design change in the end. But maybe there are some parts, let's say, uh, we are redesigning all the pop-ups and if we, if we have different button style, then we just change the button style for, for every button that is used. And, and try and and then we maybe we which we we change from this top menu entry and put on the design that you came up with and and then redesign screen by screen I, I, I don't know what what would if, be if I solution. if I if I could make a suggestion so um, upon designing upon, uh, this, the in the presentation we have in front of us there's a proposal for um, a visual identity a website and uh, a little bit of a redesign too for the um, the app itself for the client and what i was thinking because I, I was talking with manford and he mentioned that right now there's a big focus on the dao and obviously i i still believe that making the um, the user experience flawless in terms of the technology running behind the the, the client is more important than any visual appearance because in the end we don't want anybody to lose their funds or have any tr block transactions or anything, which is the priority. I was thinking that maybe there's a possibility to just do I iterative changes. As for instance, I know that this is using Java FX, and I, I don't really understand the stack. So I I saw a couple of CSS files on the on the on the GitHub repository, and maybe. It's just a matter of doing a couple of small ticks, remo uh, removing some of those more standard gradients and removing those colors and make them, making them solid uh, grays as opposed to those light grays and introducing some of the, the colors proposed on the, um, on the brand refresh. That could be sufficient just for an initial stage. While, so not to, to take a lot of focus out of the, the actual development of the, the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I um, that now. So, so, yeah, yeah, sir. Sir. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Um, it, it, by the way, I'm sure you're watching us too, Christoph. We have about four minutes left on this call. Yeah. We we have a free Zoom license that cuts us off at 45 minutes, so we can just rejoin. But I'll watch it too, and we can just shut it down. And then if that works for you, Pedro, I don't know how you are for time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, just to address this um, a kind of order of operations, um, in, in my mind, it's, it's pretty clear. And I think uh, Manfred already expressed this as well, which is that uh, basically it's excellent that we have this kind of comprehensive uh, you know, vision here, like in the PDF, like this is where it can, you know, across basically all the brand touch points. You haven't actually addressed all the brand touch points, but you know, certainly mm -hmm. the website and the, and the app are, are, the, are the main ones. Um, so to have that in mind, like a vision where we want to go is of course excellent. I think the first thing to do is without question, the website. Uh, it's, it's relatively so easy <laughs> by comparison. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the thing that's going to have, I think, the highest uh, impact for people. W what's, what's happening, and Chris, Christoph could uh, address this much better than, than I, but like if you watch our, our analytics, if you kind of think about the, you know, the funnel of people actually downloading this and then actually getting to the place where they trade, right? Um, mostly we're dropping, we're dropping everybody on the floor, right, at the, at the, at the website, um, you know, or, or even before, maybe. Uh, so, so to create an experience that does all the right things emotionally, basically to create a, 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 a website experience that lines up uh, emotionally and ideologically with, with people gives them exactly the, the kind of 
warm fuzzy that we want them to have, right? Takes the philosophy. Here's the thing, right? Like one of the things people, one of the things that people comment on about our website, kind of like you did, is, is they say things like, you know, it's not very often that I see a, a website that prominently talks about philosophy in this space, right? You know, people are impressed by that. But what they're, what they're impressed by fundamentally are, are words. Like, words are important. We mean them, right? Mm -hmm. But, but we've, we've not yet even come close to translating those words into the nonverbal, uh, non into the visual. So to do that and to have basically integrity, right, with what we're doing here, why we're doing it, and so on, and that that shows up instantly without any evaluation, without reading a single word, right, um, I think that's huge. Uh, so, so, so yeah, yeah let, maybe let, let's let's, let's pause right, here. Yeah, and, pause. yeah. I start okay. um, the session. You, you'll have to resend a. Start okay. Recording. Great. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just I'll finish that that thought. Um, yeah. So to have the to have the website show up as a as a match for all of that 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 that, um, that happens instantaneously at an emotional level, right? Uh, is is I think key, and I think. People will give us all the time in the world to get the to get the app uh, to be a complete match for that. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're getting more people in the door and they're enthused about using it, and they, and they really have the right mental model for uh, for what they're doing when they try to use this, you know, we've we've tried to communicate that now for the last six months in a in a in a like a really sustained way. Like you'll see. You know all the stuff that we've written, like this phase zero doc uh, paper. Um, you know all the presentations that I've given, podcasts that we've done, and things like that. It's it's all yeah. intended to get people in the right headspace to understand what this is and to get them excited about it. Right? It's worth being excited. Um, but it's you know one of the intentions there is so that there's not a kind of dissonance when they go to use the app where they're like, oh, why isn't this perfectly easy and instantaneous? Right? No, oh, because you're you're doing this for a particular reason, right? And there's trade-offs involved in that. So if we can if we can start to begin to do that without so many words, right? They can check out the words later, but they just get it, right? And and I, I want to just touch on some of the things in the in the PDF that you shared that that I thought did that really well. Um, uh, are you sharing the screen now? Uh, I, I can share can you? Like, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, which screen do you yeah. mean? Thanks. Um, uh, just, just the PDF. Uh, yeah, if you can just go back, like, uh, keep going back, scroll. Actually, yeah, yeah, maybe like seven or eight. Uh, or actually, go to six. Go to six. Yeah, the color, the color codes. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if this was intentional for you, but um, but that that grayscale to black to green. I mean, this is straight up, you know, VT one hundred green screen. You know. Uh, like I feel like I'm looking at a terminal when I when I look at that green on black. D did you did you intend this at all? Um, I don't uh, think so because I, I I didn't even catch a VC VC tunnel green screen. We I mean yeah it, yeah it's like it, it, like if you go back if you go back far enough uh, and you and you're looking at command line interface. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Um, yeah. It's it's just green on black, you know, blinking green cursor. Right? Yeah, was the very first thing that that that, that color combination did for me, uh, and and because it happened so instantaneously, I don't think that I would be alone in that kind of interpretation, even if people don't do it quite so explicitly, like to move away from the blue that we've done, which, as Manfred mentioned, is is pretty over. I think that's true, and to do this green. Um, I'm going I'm to digress on a couple of things here, right? So to do this green, which, which I think is pretty different. It's not overused in the, in the way that blue is. But when you combine that with, um, with the cat, uh, and want to you know, jump back to the conversation we were having a few minutes, right? And you talked about like, hey, there's this kind of stealth element, and yet it looks like it's going to come rub up against your leg, right? Like, uh, but it might scratch you too. <laughs> like, all of those things are true. Yeah, it's not, it's not threatening, but it will, it will defend itself. That's right. And it could, and it could disappear, run away stealthily and, and, and with it, stuff is true. Um, I don't know actually how much that was an explicit design intent uh, by 
by George when we did this brand refresh. But one of the things that Manfred um, told me, uh, you know, after I came back and he was and he was describing why we why we why he really went with those things uh, that we just talked about, even though they're all true and they all work, um, it was in in a way the biggest thing for him was that that, that it was not want to do this this logo uh you know there were all kinds of you know hexagonal shapes and kind of you know uh you know uh, geometric designs and stuff in the mill and and coming from like 10 different designers like he, he really put this put out a, a kind of you know a re request for, for 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 designs here uh and this as just simply unusual and that the the the, the semiotics of that, if you if you know what I mean, is totally aligned to something different. Yeah. And you should expect that this is like everything about interacting with this should silently and instantly. This is something different. It turns out it's actually the thing you've been waiting for. You just don't know it yet, <laughs> right? But it's there you're used to or the ICO websites that you're used to or whatever. So, um, so I think the combination of, you know, preserving, we go to the sort of more, more conventional, um, you know, round logo like you have there. Uh, I think, I think it's possible to see logos like that. Uh, there, there is still something different. There's a continuity there, which I think is important. Um, uh, and, and, and that kind of feeling that, 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 that getting it a blinking cursor on a, on an old school terminal all feeds into, um, what, you know, if I could, if I could say, if I could describe the design vision, that word, it would be cypherpunk. And if I could do it in two words, it would be modern cypherpunk, right? Um, has um, you know it, it largely exists kind of like a like a, uh, a you know a set of some kind of like legendary people and I don't know how deeply you know you've sort of done your homework on this Al Finney to uh, the cypherpunk mailing yeah. list and, and so on but if you if you're reasonably familiar with that or maybe even very familiar with it. You know, there was this group of people in the in the you know mid and late nineties and so on, and what what I want to see Bisk do, and I think Bisk is actually, if not you, very few projects that can really carry this torch forward. There are few projects uh, uh, more cypherpunk than this Bitcoin. Yeah, definitely. I think. <laughs> right? I think. I think. I think you know? one of the one of the main things that attracted me to BISC is how it's being developed as pretty much as the model of how Bitcoin was developed. If you look back to the, to the history of Bitcoin, I don't know. I, I feel like besides the fact that everybody knows who Manfred is, but I feel from what I've heard, he's just, he just started this because he started working on it, recruiting people. He actually... He couldn't find anybody, he did it himself, and then other people joined, and other people joined, and you just see this growing with a very, like, I don't know, there's not a, obviously there's a monetary uh, incentive or motivation behind it, but I don't feel like from anybody I hear talking about this or interviewing people talking about this that doesn't seem to be at all the primary uh, motivation which it's it, it's exciting and the fact that it, everything is like I don't know if it's intentional to me it feels like it's intentional it's and it's a very good practice that a lot of people make compromises on when they're developing other blockchain cryptocurrency related projects is that they, okay, let's paste this out of the Bitcoin model. But then the first thing they do is compromise on a bunch of things. And here it seems like it's the opposite. Uh, it feels like the BISC team is trying to, if, if they had 
compromises, they're trying to correct those as much as possible. And that to me feels like it's going in the right direction as opposed to coming up with a good idea and then mm. going in the wrong direction. Yeah, so, you know, projects, projects like Bitcoin, there are no projects like Bitcoin, there's only Bitcoin, but, but you know, like with, with Bitcoin, yeah. And, you know, and, and maybe even projects like Bitcoin too, but, but just talking about Bitcoin, it, so it, it doesn't get any messier and, and more chaotic than, than Bitcoin, right? I mean, there's really, there was really never any uh, entity or company driving it. I mean, we all know mm -hmm. this stuff, right? So that, that means that like all of the infrastructure that grew up around it, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, bit nodes, just for the first one that comes to mind, right? Like the map of all the nodes. Yeah on the network, right? You know, it's, it was just some, some project. I think that was Peter, Peter Willis project, but you know, but it was like done by him. It wasn't mm -hmm. coordinated at all. And, and you see stuff like that with, you know, Jochen's, you know, mempool viewer and, and all of that stuff. So like things that have basically become kind of critical ancillary infrastructure around Bitcoin um, really grew up in the most organic way possible. Yeah, was... So the the messiness of that and the uncorrelatedness of it and the obvious like non uh, non contiguous design of all of that it it screams the the values of decentralization because it's so obvious that these things weren't coordinated yeah. right with BISC with BISC there's I think there's actually a really interesting opportunity because yes we're deeply committed uh, to, to to those values, right? To the values of decentralization and so on. That's what's driving the whole DAO and all of that. But we really do have an organization. We really can actually present something uh, that, that has uh, a degree of unification to it, that, 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 puts, for, that puts forward a, a, a brand identity. Right. So exactly where the right line is there, like, I don't know, because if we really go where we want to go with this and by, and by the way, like the way I articulate, like the, the biggest picture thinking that, that I can do about this. Um, can you just mute Pedro? I think the wind is getting oh, sorry. in your screen. No, no worries. The, um, the, the kind of biggest picture, you know, articulation that I've been able to come up with, like, what does BISC want to be when it grows up, right? Is it, is it BISC is, is really an, another layer in the Bitcoin ecosystem. We're, we're now able to, to think and talk about in layers. Everybody knows Lightning, Layer 2, et cetera. People talk about different kinds of Layer 3 technology, whatever. Um, I see uh, what, what BISC can become, wants to become, is as a, a Bitcoin's global uh, fiat foreign exchange layer. Right. So it like it's, it's this, you know, and really think, think much bigger than we are now. Right. Where um, people are building all kinds of applications on and around BISC using our different kinds of APIs and so on. But basically, there's one giant global offer book for people who want to buy and sell Bitcoin. And that's, you know, you can get it in and out lots of other ways. You can go to centralized exchanges and so on. But in this future, it becomes increasingly um, obvious this is the way to do it this is the bitcoin way to get in and get out of bitcoin right so uh, so to 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 think about it at that level uh and, and imagine having some kind of consistency to all the different things that people would touch in that space like whatever becomes kind of i'm still trying to work with the language here i don't have great language for it but whatever becomes official BISC software that's sort of the wrong word, right? But but things that things that pass a certain bar that like, like they make it into our GitHub organization, uh, and 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 fundamentally, it's work that's being compensated by the DAO. That's actually the the, the key uh, bar that you clear is you create a new component and you sort of submit it for a compensation request, and and the other stakeholders in the DAO say. Hey, yeah, that makes sense to me. That looks really valuable. Let's let's compensate that, and everybody approves that. Uh, when people, when a project crosses that barrier, comes out of this kind of like incubating phase, or just you know something that happened in the wild and is now becoming official BISC software, that's also where we want to align uh, uh, design and branding values to whatever degree makes sense. Right, might be light touch. It might be just certain elements. Uh, it doesn't have to be 
you know, necessarily like everything looks totally conformist. But, uh, but I, I just, I, w- I want to share some of these things because I think we have, uh, like I said, a real opportunity to, yeah, be like Bitcoin and, and develop and grow like Bitcoin, but also be more unified uh, in, in, in how we do that and how we present that visually. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think it's uh, probably the biggest challenge is to, to strike up that balance without going like it needs to grow and we can pretty much impulse that growth. But how do we still keep it somewhat organic? And Because uh, I, I imagine that a lot of your users are highly skeptical and don't trust anything and like me myself was a kind of a little bit of skeptic until I actually tried it so going a little too far might feel like selling out is not necessarily the the right term but it might feel like it was a little bit of a takeover or something and I don't know it's yeah it's, yeah one one way that I resolve this is is that if you think about this this potential future that I'm talking about where it, where it really it, it revolves around for me this idea that there's a global offer book for, uh, for Bitcoin to fiat trades. Uh, and that's fundamentally protocol level thinking, right? So the protocol need not have much branding at all, right? Protocols don't need branding. What protocols need is, is, is words and, 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 and rigorous definitions of things. So like if you look at the... Um, uh, Lightning's, if you look at the lightning.network website, um, this is something that, you know, that I take a lot of inspiration from with regard to, um, just, just real quick, Pedro, do you have a picture in your head of the lightning.network oh, website? Or wait to see. Yeah, I, 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 or, yeah I'm familiar. Chris, I've Chris been there Michael multiple times. Yeah. It's just, but it's, um, it's real I think bare it's bones, slight, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just a it's just a bootstrap website, but you know it's just gray, and you know and it says what Lightning is, and you can go download some PDFs and stuff like that, right? It's it's basically, you know, a, a, a website for a couple of white papers, um, but that's totally appropriate because Lightning is fundamentally a protocol, and uh, and this is um, this is uh, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to mention on this call is we want to figure out how to position. BISC as all the things that it is, right? So mostly when people think about BISC, they think about a desktop app because that's the sort of most salient, you know, artifact of BISC. It is that, right? It's a desktop app that you can use to trade Bitcoin with. Um, but under underneath that, of course, is a, is a trading protocol uh, with, you know, all of the, you know, message definitions and, and, and you know, the, the peer-to-peer the protocol and all of that stuff, right? So that stuff, if, if BISC is going to really grow and become that kind of global fiat foreign exchange layer for Bitcoin, it, there will be a point at which it, it is basically protocol first, right? And, and, the, and the BISC desktop implementation becomes something like a reference implementation, perhaps. And the suite of the BISC suite of software around that protocol becomes just that, right? You know, there's the BISC desktop, there's BISC mobile, there's, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe we build a, a kind of BISC branded block explorer. You know, think about um, uh, like blockchain explorer, right? One of the, and this will get very digressive, so I'm just gonna try to touch briefly on some of these things. It, it, one of the ways that I like to think about uh, what we're doing with BISC is that we're, we're step-by-step, component-by-component, building uh, a suite of software that allows people to have on their own laptop a personal money fortress, right? Uh, Where really everything you need from wallet to exchange to um, block explorer, right? Like, why do we go to these websites? Why do we go to to, to trade block or bid APS or blockchain.info? Why don't we have a locally running web app for people who really care about privacy, right? Uh, where you know, you're talking to your own local Bitcoin Core client, it, 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 you know, BISC, Bitcoin Core, right? So like imagine that suite of software that just gets increasingly, um, you know, autonomous, right? You know, you, you just as an individual are increasingly autonomous with your, with your uh, money, right? So 
uh, you know, I, I like to imagine that suite of software being kind of the gold standard, you know, implementation that works against this open protocol, the BISC protocol. Uh, but the BISC protocol is just that. It's wide open and there's all sorts of reasons that other people who have nothing to do with BISC, other entities, would want to plug into it, right? If it really is Bitcoin's global fiat foreign exchange layer, there would be a lot of people plugging into that. And that's where uh, any, any concerns about uh, a too conformist uh, design vision basically just go away because everybody will do their own thing, just like they do in Bitcoin. There's a thousand different looking wallets and so on. Nobody's dictating how they should look. Uh, and it would be the same with this layer, just like it'll be with Lightning. But BISC's suite of software could of course have its own uh, design values that are consistent. Yeah, of course, I, I, I can totally see that. My, I guess, and, and maybe I, I think I, I fully understand what you just explained, but I guess my only, Concern is trying to differentiate from the BISC pro protocol and the, the kind of the BISC uh, client as the product and just imagining the, the growth and the adoption curve. I would imagine that, uh, and maybe, maybe I'm, this is a misconception on my end, but I, when I, what first excited me about this was that the fact that maybe I could get my friends that are not even that interested in. The, the whole ideology behind Bitcoin, maybe get them to experience how easy it should be to buy a Bitcoin without, through the banking mm -hmm. channels. And uh, a, lot of that, a lot of these users are not necessarily interested in how escrow protocols work. I, I think it's personally, for me, it's very interesting and it, it's, it's something that should be very open. I certainly don't have the technical capabilities of understanding everything that's going on the on the back end, but I I was coming out at, at more at, at that point of view where more of a, trying to get more users to join in, not necessarily fully on on the technical sides and not necessarily even on on the ideology of the logical side. It's kind of get them get some bitcoins into the an actual wallet as opposed to like a lot of my friends in Portugal, they're, they're, they're using this uh, eToro exchange. I don't even know that they, they trade everything from Apple to, to Bitcoin and they don't even see their balance in Bitcoin. They mm. just see their balance in euros. I asked them yeah. how many Bitcoin they have and they, I mean, going from there to actually, I don't know, having a hardware or paper wallets or actually understanding what a private key is, it's a... I don't, <laughs> it's very hard for them because the, the way they have to, to do Bitcoin is buy five years of Bitcoin and then those five years are one euro. Oh, okay, I'm not interested in Bitcoin. But yeah, you still have that, that fraction of a Bitcoin. That fraction of Bitcoin didn't change, but they only see the value of the, the dollar. So to me, this, it was all, what got me into this was more, of a really easy way. Everybody knows Venmo, everybody knows all these European, that I'm actually not very familiar with, but all these European apps and new protocols of transaction between EU banks that allow instant transactions with just a, a quick number. And mm -hmm. to get them having a, like a, an actual client wallet as opposed to this, whatever, it's even worse than Coinbase, the, the place that most of the people I know have their Bitcoin stored. I don't even know if there's a Bitcoin there. Maybe it's just like a, a derivative or a bet on a Bitcoin. But, and that's why I, I'm kind of just trying to, to show that I'm a little, conf not confused, but it's a little surprising that you want to go towards more the, the protocol approach, which I think it's totally viable. I had just not, never thought about it. Uh, yeah, let me, let me clarify that a little bit, uh, because really the reason that I bring that up is in the context of what might all of the BISC-related applications in the future look like, right? And if we yeah. think that there is a protocol driving this, and that really the BISC protocol becomes first class, that, then there's every reason to believe that there would be a total multiplicity of designs and people building apps and, oh, yeah. and, and wallets and integrations. So from our perspective of making our implementation right on top of that protocol, 
yeah, we would never want to present the BISC protocol as the BISC protocol to essentially, uh, you know, retail users, right? Uh, not at all. So we want to make it increasingly easy for uh, non-technical, non-savvy people to, to get involved. So I think, I think what, what we've said here is like not mutually exclusive at all. So I don't want to start presenting to people the BISC protocol like that. But I mentioned yeah, that there is an audience, there's an audience of basically developers that we do, I think, want to increasingly present it to them that way, right? So they can start doing their own thing on top of it. This is all like, you know, again, like the biggest possible picture thinking that I've been able to do. Uh, I think it's good, good to mention that, right? Just to have all the context. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, everything, I, everything you said makes sense too. Yeah, see, I, I, now that you mentioned, I think I kind of, I, I, maybe I'm still a little unfamiliar with the whole potential of the, the BISC platform and protocol. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that as time goes by, I'll become more familiar and understand the potential a little better. Yeah. Yeah. One, um, uh, one thing maybe just to, to wrap up that, this part of the conversation is I think it's show up to a project like this or to BISC and to say like, hey, let's make this as easy as possible so that yeah, basically just everybody, everybody uses this instead of you know, Coinbase or eToro or, or, or whatever. And that's like hard to argue with. Yeah, well, why not, right? But in, in my experience so far, I'm not sure that it's, that might not be the, the optimum for us. That might not be the sweet spot. Uh, it, it, or at least in the, in the near future, like as a staged approach, like we can definitely make this a lot easier to use and a lot more beautiful, and we should, right? Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that what we want to leap to is basically the the brand new Bitcoiner uh, who has no context at all, right? I, so I'm, I'm going to share, you know, I, Christoph will tell you, he's heard me say this a thousand times, right? Um, and, you know, I think it resonates for people. I do want to hear from, from, from other people, like in a design conversation, like the ones that we'll have around this. Other people need to express that they're aligned with what I'm about to say. But for me, like how I want to position this or how I want to evolve it in the near term is, is like I said, modern cypherpunk, right? And I want to start to address as an audience what I think of as newly born cypherpunks, right? And one of the one of the things about that whole kind of you know legend of of, of you know, cypherpunk history and so on is it feels like there are these small group of people that we call the cypherpunks and they include Adam Back and whomever, uh, and they're the cypherpunks and we're all living in their world now because of Bitcoin, right? And I think this, that's all true and it's nice to sort of pay homage to that, that's all great. But I think the thing that has a lot more power is, is to create a, a, a context in which everybody who is aligned with these ideas can identify themselves as cypherpunks, right? And they say, hey, because I really get Bitcoin, because I, I, I get the values, because I get the ideology, I, I want to act accordingly. I, I want to maintain my privacy. I want to, you know, use Bitcoin as Bitcoin was designed, et cetera, et cetera, right? Well, that kind of makes you a cypherpunk, right? Like, so, so people taking that on for themselves, well, of course they would run their own Bitcoin full node. Of course they would use BISC. Of course they would do things that a cypherpunk would do, right? So I think that's a growing demographic right now. And I think it, it's growing in a way that, kind of fits with our organic growth already. So I wonder if we can maybe even accelerate that pie growing, that number of people out there, newly born cypherpunks, right? And that BISC is really like, you know, that whole idea, like if you're trying to be all things to all people, you'll, you, you won't be for anybody, right? Like yeah, polarization yeah. is good, focus is good. Like I think where BISC is right now is it's a significantly technical product focus on a significantly technical demographic, right? And I think if we can round off the rough edges a little bit, make it easier to get into it, make it really beautiful and create all of those kind of emotional responses that I was talking about. Like, hey, it feels good to use Cypherpunk software, right? 
uh, I think we can actually make a, a real dent here. I think we can actually meaningfully accelerate the number of people who are taking on the, the, the thinking, right? Um, but that's a little bit different than let's, uh, uh, let's just make it as easy to use as possible for everybody. So that, that's the distinction that I wanted to make there. Yeah, I agree. And um, maybe, maybe I, I'm a little too focused on the ease of use, but definitely my, my focus on the ease of use was also to, to maybe just get people with ownership of their private keys so they can actually understand it a little better. So I don't see it as maybe as misaligned as I thought from what you initially mentioned, but definitely it's, it's good to, to hear you say that because it actually um, gives a little bit more meaning to the, to the whole project. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm just thinking about the yeah. time. Um, how, how are you doing? I think we're well over an hour now. I got, probably should go back to work. I have a meeting in a, in a couple of, in some like half an hour that I need to prepare. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you, do you want me to just uh, run really to the PDF and just be some selective or uh, yeah, you were, you were just breaking up a little bit, yeah. um, but you were saying, do you want to run through, uh, yeah, maybe the, I can just really quickly. Yeah. Just before I go. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd say, uh, let, let's do that. And then let's just talk next up. Yeah. Or we can just talk next, next steps. I, I don't know. Do you have any, yeah. any pressing questions about the PDF? I tried to make it as self-explanatory as possible. No, I mean, it, it did that. Right. That's why I was so eager yeah. to, to talk. Um, yeah, so for, for me, I mean, basically the next step that I had in mind was uh, let's, let's do this, basically. I mean, let's, let's, uh, let's do the website. Um, you already started on it, which is, which is amazing. Um, I, I would see that being um, probably a collaboration between uh, you, uh, Diogo. I, I'm not sure his skills. I haven't actually met him yet. I know you have, Chris. Um, uh, pr probably me uh, with copy. Mm -hmm. Right, like sure. there's all kinds of words on the website that can be reworked. Um, many of those words are mine from way back, but but that's that's something that I can do. Right, is kind of you know like let's let's see how do we want to present it from yeah. the, from the uh, verbal. I, I, I uh, the, so I, I forked the project on GitHub and mm -hmm. I've been trying to keep as much as possible of the. I I don't know. I moved some pages around just from a personal perspective. I thought that maybe we could reduce the. The, the navigation a little bit just to make it more concise and the language yeah. I don't know maybe most of it is probably placeholder but I kept the the, J, the Jekyll and the Ruby implementation so because I, I imagine that you want to keep this all self-sustaining github so that's why you're not using a database yeah anymore. exactly static all okay. the way right and and by the way if we want to do things like you know forms or something like that if, if we ever have that need right I, I don't know what it would be but um the hosting platform that we're using netlify is pretty advanced it can actually do a lot of dynamic stuff like handle form mm -hmm. submissions for example um all while building on top of a fundamentally static stack so so we, we actually have options and might be kind of surprising what we could do but yeah absolutely static 100 percent all get source controlled we just don't need a database cool um the other thing that you should know i did you 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 did see it because i pointed you at the new contributor yes, yes, yes. checklist so you've mm -hmm. seen the, the doc site right and that's all um that's ascii doctor which is uh, a, a tool chain on top of ascii doc uh which is like markdown i'm I don't not know familiar you, but you know it. i can look it up but yeah, are, you, are you familiar with Markdown? Um, Markdown, no, actually not. What yeah, it's just, it's just a, a plain text uh, uh, markup language. Instead of HTML, you're just using, you know, an asterisk is a bullet. Oh, point. got it, I got it, got it, uh, got it. it. That kind of thing, right? Uh, you, you, you probably have seen it, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on all the, the like, uh, the stack, like any time you're not able to use it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So ASCII doc is like that markdown, but, uh, but much more advanced. You can do a lot more with it. And so that's why we, it's also all static, but the question will be the relationship between these websites. And, and I, I actually see the website can be very minimal, really like, like there's many things that are there now can go. Uh, we can even possibly take down the blog. We're basically not using it at all. So like, 
basically we can put it all on, on the chopping block. Don't assume that anything in particular needs to stick around. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to, if you want to put together like you know, just a first cut at the home page, you know that really just implements what you've done in the PDF, just yeah. to have something to stare at and talk about, then that's that's a fine uh, next step. And then we can talk about how to how to adapt that to the docs website and stuff like that. You know, what I was hoping to do, especially with the GitHub fork, was just to to kind of build uh, a. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Chris just dropped out. But oh. I think Chris just dropped out of the conference call. Mm -hmm. Okay, is, well, what I was saying is... Yeah. You oh, shoot. No, no, now you're back. Hello? Sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, the connection broke down. Now I hear you. Can, can you hear me as well? Uh, oh. I hear you, but also I'm looking at my battery. I have three percent battery, okay. so I'm not going to be able to hang out for much longer. Okay, no worries. Uh, Chris' battery also died. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So we can we can continue this conversation on yeah. Slack. Uh, what I just wanted to say really quickly before I I, I drop out, um, I think I don't know who, who's more on top of the um, of the styling of the the clients. What I was going to suggest to you and to Chris was, if possible, if there was like really minor changes to do on the style of the app. So in case we launch a new branding identity and a new website, if we could just align just tiny things like color and maybe typeface. I don't know exactly how that Java, the Java. Yeah, so you can imagine it's kind of a component based uh, framework and you can style it uh, with a CSS like uh, format. And you can do a lot of stuff. So you can you can customize as much as you want. So you, yeah, it's just a matter of um, how much work, how much effort you put into it. Maybe I'll take a look. I'll I'll try to download the source code yeah. and build and, it. Uh, and, yeah, and regarding uh, UI effect. So if you want to have more motion design, also regarding kind of button clicks, there are also frameworks, for example that emulates um, um, the Google material design effects, how our buttons are working and how text feels. So, so it might not be a lot of work to do this kind of redesign, but yeah, we just have to have a look um, how, how we want to make this progress from, from the current version to the next version, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about really, really small stuff so we can maybe launch the website and instead of waiting another year for a full like re-implementation of the styles on the clients, just try to launch the website and then try to launch a, a very slight uh, redesign of the, just like very superficial styling. Mm -hmm. And just so there's a, a connection between the, the, yeah. the, the design and the app so people yeah. don't feel like totally separated elements. Yeah, but that's... What, what, what we could think about is maybe start um, skinning, reskinning the, the basic components to match the style, like have buttons, radio buttons, combo boxes. This might be regarding effort, okay to do in, in reasonable yeah. time. I'll just I'll just have to learn. I, I don't know exactly how to how to build and compile uh, have a, the application. Yeah, have applications. That's all. Like uh, with HTML and CSS, it's easy. I work with web design all the time, but with Java, uh, more complicated. But I'm sure I can learn it. Is there is there any resource online to explain how how the um, how we go from um, downloading the um, the source code on yes. GitHub and there actually are, building the app? Yeah, there's there's documentation. Okay, I'll look it up. So if if you have a Mac which I, I think you have, yes. then the, um, it's quite straightforward. So that's quite, we also, there is, there's a, uh, a documentation, I think it's in the, in the build directory. I have to look it up, but I can send you the links. And also in the wiki uh, for more sophisticated setup, um, there's also explanations how to do local trading and use the local Bitcoin core client. Now I think you, your battery just died. Or at least I don't see you anymore. And now, now you're back. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's let's uh, continue. Sorry, you dropped off. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Let, let's continue the discussion on Slack and just regroup maybe uh, beginning of next week. Right. Thank you so much. Really nice to meet you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And good. thank you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye. You too.